Death matching. Some people say it doesn't help you improve, while other people are grinding it 24-7 like it's the magic solution. And at the same time, some people avoid it only because they keep getting shot in the back. Me personally, I wouldn't take this level of I think deathmatching is very useful, so what's in it for you? Well, you're probably deathmatching wrong, and in this video, I'll explain why. What's up guys, I'm Royal G, a Radiant player and coach who likes teaching players about less obvious insights into fundamental topics. Deathmatching is something I see too much bad advice on, so I'm going to tell you four mistakes that you need to fix in order to make deathmatches an efficient practice tool. If this helps, make sure to share it to others. Let's head into it. So the first mistake that I see so many players make stems from a reaction to a common pain point of deathmatching, which is sound whoring. I think everyone mutually hates that one guy who sits in a corner and has volume on max so that he can shoot people running by him. And because everyone hates that guy and people get so frustrated about it, people have sort of mistakenly assumed that using sound is just bad overall. But it really isn't. It's just that you can use it in a cheesy way that wastes everyone's time, including your own. I guess what I'm trying to say here is, you don't have to be that guy even if you're using sound to deathmatch. In fact, you shouldn't deathmatch with sound off at all. Let me explain. Sound is a very important aspect of Valorant, and sound itself conveys a lot of information, such as the enemy's location, how they might swing, and in gunfights, whether they're baiting your shot, committing, or even recovering from recoil. If you don't have this type of information heading into a fight, it fundamentally alters your approach, which is to say, if you have sound off, you play deathmatch very differently from if you had sound on. That means the way you swing things change, as well as the way you place your crosser on some angles, the way you adjust mid-duel, and unless you're practicing for when Fade ults your sight, you pretty much never play Valorant with sound off anyways. So having sound off prevents you from abusing sound and camping sound, but also puts you in an environment that's more unrealistic and overall wastes your time just as much as camping a corner. That's why having sound on is something I always tell my coaching students when talking about DMing, because at some point, our community decided that having sound off was the way to go. And as a small shameless plug, I coach on Medify and sometimes stream live coaching on my Twitch, so if you're interested in that, you're always welcome to click the link in the description and come say hi. Do you want to reach your rank goals this act? Or maybe you just want to find the right place to learn Valorant and improve with the right people? Well, good news, because I want to tell you guys about a place called Gosu Academy. In Gosu Academy, you have access to some of the best coaching you'll find anywhere. Not only can you take classes on advanced theory and VOD review taught by professional coaches, you can also learn Team Valorant by joining their weekly rank-based 10 men that are also similarly guided by coaches. And if that wasn't already a sign for you to take a deeper look, there's more. Every single month, Gosu Academy invites a coach from a franchise team to give an exclusive guest lecture. So if you wanted to learn from the literal best the industry has to offer, they've got you covered. And it may seem crazy, but Gosu Academy even decided to help give you guys a crazy offer. The first 50 people who sign up with the code ROYALG will not only gain access to everything just mentioned, but they get 30 days completely free. That's 30 days of coaching from the best in the business. So don't miss out on this opportunity. Sign up for Gosu Academy today. And as a final note, thank you Gosu Academy for sponsoring this video. So let me ask, if you want to work on your first bullet accuracy and spray discipline, what should you do? If you said use a share for guardian only, then unfortunately you're wrong. And to explain why this is the wrong approach, let me explain first how first bullet accuracy is actually built. First bullet accuracy in most cases isn't about mechanical aim, but mental aim. It's not hard to mechanically adjust to a target's head, but it's way harder to mentally confirm that your crosshair is on top of that head. So in order to improve your first bullet accuracy, you need to be faster with confirming the shot while also minimizing your hesitation. The confirmation is focus, and the hesitation stems from discipline. But at the same time, your focus also relies on discipline because hesitation will ruin your focus. What I'm basically saying is, your focus and discipline play a much larger role when it comes to practicing first bullet accuracy, with discipline at its core. So how does this apply to using sheriffs and guardians? Well, sheriffs and guardians may help you with focus, but it won't help your discipline. In fact, it can even make it worse. Discipline isn't avoiding the temptation, but facing it and still being untempted. If that confused you, then let me give you an analogy I like to use. Imagine you're trying to stop snacking on potato chips. To do this, you decided that you need to remove the potato chips from your desk. So you put the chips away and everything is fine. But one day, you and your friends decide to start studying together and, uh-oh, he always brings some potato chips to share. What happens? Well, you'll probably end up eating the potato chips. 
But what if instead of removing the chips from your desk, you place the chips on the desk and train yourself to stop yourself every time you think about snacking on the chips? Then you'll probably tell your friend, I'm good, and study without an issue. You see, using the sharer for Guardian is like removing the potato chips from your desk. It works when you don't have potato chips near you, but as soon as you see them, you're much more likely to snack. The sheriff and guardian force you to shoot one bullet at a time, so you never need to worry about spraying or even consider it. So you lose the hesitation, but at the same time, you aren't building discipline. And then when you use the vandal or phantom in ranked, you just spray away because you haven't actually trained yourself to tap intentionally. And this doesn't just apply to spraying or first bullet accuracy, it applies to crouching, overheating, and a lot more. Once again, discipline isn't avoiding the temptation, but facing it and still being untempted. I think it goes without saying, but deathmatch isn't completely realistic. Players might move differently, peek in weird places, and there's also no abilities being used. But just because it's unrealistic to the actual game, doesn't mean it's bad as a practice tool. Of course, that relies on you knowing what you want to practice first. When entering a DM, most people just play some music and roam around and shoot things. There's no goal in mind, no objective other than to shoot some heads. So what do they do? Run around and shoot some heads, but what do they gain? Very little, if not nothing. There's a lot of factors that go into a strong peak or solid crosser placement or good awareness and movement as you guys may already know. It's very hard to practice all these things at once. And in ranked, your focus is on winning. Add on the fact that in a match, you'll have maybe 30 to 40 duels over a 45 minute period. It's very hard to practice effectively. Deathmatch is the solution to that. You can enter with the intention to practice something specific like being aware of enemy locations or having strong crosser placement and you're also getting to see it in action against other players. Although it's not fully realistic, deathmatching lets you practice a specific skill as long as you have the intention to do so. But like I said earlier, you have to know what you want to practice. If you aren't aware of your goal, you're much less likely to achieve it. So enter each deathmatch with an idea of what you actually want to work on and DMs will become a lot more productive. So the last thing people often do wrong that I'll cover isn't something that's new or hard to figure out, which is playing for kills or the win. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's fine to try to win a deathmatch or get as many kills as possible, but don't let it be your goal while playing a deathmatch. Remember, deathmatch is a tool for improvement and not a competitive game mode. Your purpose for playing is to practice different aspects of your mechanics or awareness and not to win or get a good KD. When you play to win, your focus in the deathmatch is fundamentally off. But it's not so much to say that you can't win while DMing, but more to say that if you do try to win, you're more likely to create bad habits and fail to practice what you were trying to practice in the first place. If we think back about the guy who sits in a corner just camping sound for kills, this guy might have a nice KD or win a deathmatch here and there, but realistically, we all know he's not accomplishing much. That's on the extreme side of playing to win. But at the same time, you don't want to just forget about kills completely because then you're just going in half-assed and maybe practicing badly. There's a balance between looking at your results, which are kills and wins, and focusing on your improvement. Of course, the balance leans more towards focusing on improvement, and the wins will come naturally. So in summary, deathmatching is a very useful tool for improving, but requires the right approach. More than anything else, having a clear goal and intention when practicing is what makes practice useful. It's not practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice makes perfect. But do you know the secret to mastering DMing? How about you DM some bitches?